what we are doing and why we are doing it. And uh, so that's what I want to minister from the book of Acts chapter 17. The, the story is told of an evangelist that he was preaching from the text that I'm going to preach from this morning. Acts 17, 6, that says these men that have turned the world upside down have come here also. Using that text, he preached his sermon. It had very, three very simple points. He said, first, the world is wrong side up. Point two, the world must be turned upside down. And point three, we are the people to set it right. That is a very, very good description of what we do and what we believe in in church planting. And I want to preach a message I've entitled, Turning the World Upside Down. Acts 17, starting at verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating uh, that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ or the Messiah. And some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, not a few of the leading women, they joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace. And gathering a, a mob, they set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. When they didn't find them, they dragged Jason some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king named Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest... They let them go, turning the world upside down. Let's begin. I want to talk about this strategy of revolution. The text that we read shows us the strategy God uses to reach the world for Jesus. This is the record of reaching a new area uh, for Jesus, a city called Thessalonica. It was the uh, Greek city in the region of Macedonia. So this begins by giving the reason why we plant couples out is because there are people in other places that need Jesus. And God expects us as a church and us as believers to do something about those who are lost. Romans 1.14, Paul said, I am a debtor. Other translations say, I have a duty to all people, to Greeks and those who are not Greeks. Literally what Paul is saying is God saved us. We owe him for salvation. How can you ever pay God back? There is no amount of money that you could ever pay that would repay God for salvation. But he says what we can do is preach the gospel to other people who are lost. To spread the gospel. The strategy that we see in this text is exactly the strategy that we are following in our church and in launching out Nate and Ashley. We reach the world, it's accomplished through discipleship. When converts respond to the call, people get saved. When God begins to move upon their heart, they make themselves available, a genuine convert wants to do God's will. Acts 13, 2, they were worshiping the Lord and fasting for a time. And the Holy Spirit said to them, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to do a special work for which I've chosen them. This is what God does. Everyone is expected to do something for God, but some people, God says, I have a work 
for you that involves going to another place to preach the gospel. And converts are trained through the process of discipleship in a, in a local church. They're trained to fulfill their calling in God. It tells us a second thing in this text. Not only is it discipleship, which is the training method, but it is accomplished through the going principle. Very simply, we cannot reach other places if we all stay here. Someone has to go where the lost are in order to preach to them. Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. Acts 13, 3, after they fasted and prayed, they laid hands on Barnabas and Saul and they sent them out. This is what we do. We believe that we owe the gospel to uh, those who are lost in other cities, in other places. And so we are going to follow the pattern in this scripture. We are sending Nate and Ashley Rush to Santa Fe, New Mexico, because someone has to go. Third thing in this text, you reach the world by declaring the message of Jesus Christ. Verse 2 and 3, Paul went in for three Sabbaths, reason for the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. The only way that people will know about Jesus is if we tell them, Romans 10, 14 and 15, how shall they call in him whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? The gospel must be declared. There are people, they try all kinds of different methods. Gospel t-shirts. I was in a restaurant one time pulling napkins out of the dispenser and out came a gospel track like, ooh, clean greasy hands and get saved at the same time. Isn't that amazing? But what needs to happen, Paul declared. Paul told, this is what we are sending Nate and Ashley to do, and I'm confident they're going to do this through personal evangelism. They are going to preach Jesus through outreach. Outreach means you either find a, an existing crowd or you create a crowd so that you can preach Jesus. And in this, Paul, his message is Jesus. He's not preaching opinions or politics. It's not entertainment. It is Jesus, 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 Jesus is the answer. That is the message that we preach. Years ago, the Salvation Army printed a picture in their uh, magazine. It was a, a, a painting of a, a boat out in the ocean surrounded by men and women that were struggling. They were sinking. They were drowning. And in that picture, William Booth, who was the founder of the Salvation Army, he was pictured in the rear of the boat extending his hand over the side to those who were drowning. He had a very young grandson. He, when he saw that painting, he looked for a long time, and then he asked his mother, Mama, what is Grandpa doing in the boat? Is he trying to help the people get in the boat, or is he just shaking hands with them? Listen, our message and our call is not just to shake hands with sinners. It is to get them in the boat. And that is what we do. It is evangelism the final step here is conversion we're not sending Nate nationally just to gather a crowd certainly we are not sending them to gather people from other churches verse 4 some are persuaded Greeks and leading women they join Paul and Silas these people were converted they used to be following Judaism. They used to be sinners, but they got converted. This is why we're sending the rushes is to make converts, to get people saved. You can build a church on 
converts. You, you may be able to attract a crowd in many different ways. That will not build a church. You may be able to attract people from other churches, but you can't build a church on that. Converts are transformed. Converts are grateful. Converts are teachable. Converts are willing to do the work of God. And so here is the pattern that we see. That is the strategy of revolution. Let's look at a second thought for a moment. I want to talk about trouble on the way. Some people are unrealistic, both in life and ministry. Some people think like this, because we're doing God's will as a church, or because I am doing God's will personally, that means everything will always go smoothly. Every person we witness to, they will get saved. They will change completely and immediately. They will lock in and be eternally grateful name children after us, or if not, then at least small pets, because they'll be so grateful. <laughs> there are people that believe every single church we ever plant will be an absolute raging success. Every couple we send out will do right, and they will know exactly what they should do. The problem is the Bible is an honest book. If we were writing a book, that's how we would write it. But the Bible is honest. Jesus, when he was sending workers out, he prepared them for the possibility of trouble. He didn't send them to fail, but he said, you have to be realistic. Luke 9, 5, whoever will not receive you, he said, some of your outreaches are not going to go well. I, I can tell you, I think I told you, and Lisa and I, our, our very first outreach we did in Johannesburg, South Africa, we had uh, the only people that came. It was a terrible rainstorm. We had three kids and a dog. The dog didn't want to get saved, and lightning struck and blew up the projector. That one didn't make the trumpet. <laughs> I didn't report on that one in conference. That's the way life is. Some things don't go well. Verse 5, in our text, here's a powerful work of God being established. But the Bible says, but others became jealous. They got evil men to form a mob and start a riot. They ran to Jason's house looking for Paul and Silas. They wanted to bring them out to the people. And to bring them out, they wanted to beat them. So the end result is that Paul and Silas had to leave town. Think about that. This is the Bible telling us about the establishing of a church. Trouble is also a part of church planting. The devil uses trouble to try and derail the mission. This is what happens in the church. People who don't understand this, they look and they say, yeah, yeah, you, you send people out, but sometimes... Some of those people come home and there are people that the wrong conclusion is, so that means that this discipleship thing doesn't work. That's incorrect. The devil uses this to mess with the minds of workers. They go believing that God is going to help them. Again, as the Bible is honest, sometimes there's trouble on the way and this messes with their head. Everyone's looking at you. The pastor is disappointed and angry because you didn't have incredible success. Listen to me. According to this scripture, according to common sense, we understand this. We send couples out with the knowledge that not every single work we plant will be a raging success. And that's okay. I don't know. I think sometimes the problem is there are people, they were raised maybe in, maybe in your home. There was, you weren't allowed to ever make a mistake or fail. And so if you transfer that in the work of God, it'll mess with your head that somehow uh, 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 everyone's going to hate you if you don't do well. That's not realistic. We plant churches and we understand sometimes there's trouble on the way 
that's okay. I'm not looking for it. I'm not happy about it, but it's simply a part of life. There are workers that go out, they give it their best shot, but sometimes you're just tired and beat up. You need to be refreshed. Sometimes we send workers out and they learn and they come to their own conclusion. You know what? I think I missed some things in my training. I need to work that out. So the overall goal, we practice redirection sometimes. We bring couples back, not because we view them as failures. We bring them back with the overall goal, get refreshed, get recalibrated so they can go out again. See, destiny is a process. It is not an end result in itself. It's a process. A process means a series of steps toward an eventual result. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Steps. This is talking about life. Life is not just, I achieve the goal, I'm a raging success, therefore I'm finished for life. He says, no, life is a series of steps. Sometimes it looks like you're going straight forward. Sometimes it looks like you're going back. Sometimes it's incredibly successful. Sometimes at the moment it doesn't look like success. And yet they're all steps. Think about Paul and the context of, of our story that we read in chapter 17. If you read Acts 16, uh, or, or uh, we read in Thessalonica, they're arrested and uh, uh, beaten and had to leave town. Acts 17, there's a riot and they're run out of town. In Berea, there's trouble and Paul had to leave town. He preaches in Athens and gets very little response at all. And all of that is part of the will of God, not only for the workers, but also the sending congregation. We understand destiny is a process. This is why I am excited this morning. Nate and Ashley, we sent them out. They came back for redirection, but thank God we're sending them out again. And that is the will of God. That is what we want. See, this has to be our understanding in life. My father is the founder of our church and the founder of our fellowship. Some of you, I don't know if you know this, you see the, you know, he's celebrated for his success. My father quit the ministry completely twice. Didn't go well. Struggling in himself, not seeing results, and yet, he found the will of God. That's why many of us are here today. Saved because we factor this in. Trouble on the way does not mean that the workers are bad. It doesn't mean that discipleship doesn't work. It is just steps along the way for the will of God. Let's look at one final thought. I want to talk about turning the world upside down. God records the text that we read together because it shows us what God honors. What is it that pleases God and makes him want to help us? We see in our text, God honors courage. Sometimes, you know, you do an outreach, it doesn't go well, or, or some of you came back for redirection. Think about Paul, all the different places he went arrested and beaten you know I, my wife and I this is our joke there are people that they they seem to enjoy giving the message of ministry they have gone out they're missionaries or pastors they like telling people it's hard oh it's hard I think I think they do that for attention I don't know if it was hard for you I, you weren't beaten last time I checked how I many of you were arrested, thrown into prison for this? But Paul would be beaten, run out of town, and he would say, where can we go next? That is courage. Courage is facing your fears. 
You know, the no fear t-shirt. The only people who have no fear are drunk. <laughs> right? Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. God honors courage. Number two, God honors faith. Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. This pleases God. When, when people believe him, enough to risk without a guaranteed outcome. It is a risk for Nate and Ashley to go. Is it guaranteed that they will succeed? No. And yet they're believing God anyway. We plant workers. Are we guaranteed that every investment will be a, a, a numerical success? No, but we believe God. Charles Spurgeon said these words, I recommend you either believe God up to the hilt or don't believe at all. Believe this book of God, every letter of it, or else reject it. There is no logical standing place between the two. Oh, I pray you do believe in God and his omnipotence. Thirdly, we see that God honors commitment. And that means dedication to a cause. We read about Paul and he kept going in obedience to the call of God. You know, in our church since 1973, we started sending couples in 1973. And since then, we have never stopped. We send and send and send and send, and we will keep sending couples until Jesus comes back. That takes a commitment in life. We ha we've seen just about everything that you can see, good, bad, and ugly. Doesn't matter, we're gonna send and keep on sending. Recent study of Nobel Prize winners they, they begin to look at why do these people succeed? And they said that Nobel Prize winners are no more intelligent than their colleagues. So what was the trait that caused them to ultimately reach success? They were good finishers. That's what we have to be. We are committed to church planting and we are believing God. In our text... The promise is that God will help us make impact. Verse 6, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. You want to make impact. You want people to know that something is going on. I've been in different places where... People have said in various settings, I've heard of you. Not, not me personally, but talking about our church or, or our fellowship. I've heard of you. That's impact. They understand that we are preaching for life change. This is not, they were not meaning to compliment them. When they said, these men who have turned the world upside down. You know why they said that? Because they didn't just come and said, would you like to come to church? That wasn't their message. They were preaching, your life needs to change. You need to turn from your sin. You need to stop the way that you're living. We're not preaching for comfortable religion. We're preaching for life change. Years ago, on one of the tours to Israel, there was a group of people, they were Christians from somewhere else, and they asked our tour group, what, what, what group are you with? Who are you with? They said, we're with the potter's house. Sometimes it's called the door in different places. And they said, oh, the potter's house. Ah, the repenters. And they said that derisively. Yes, Thank God. I wish I had a recording of that. That is exactly who we are. 
They turn the world upside down because we preach repent. The same message that Jesus Christ said, change your mind about your sin, change your lifestyle. When Jesus comes in your heart, it is impossible, but what he will cause a revolution and turn your world upside down. And he, the reason why they heard is because God had blessed their ministry, Acts 2.47, every day the Lord, the Lord added to those being, who were being saved to the group of believers. Acts 6.7, the word of God continued to spread. The group of followers in Jerusalem increased and a great number of Jewish priests believed and obeyed. Acts 9, Saul, their greatest persecutor gets saved. Acts 9, 31, the group of believers continue to grow. Acts 10, the Gentiles, non-Jews, start turning to Jesus. Acts 11, 21, the Lord was helping the believers and a large group of people believed and turned to the Lord. Acts 16, a demon-possessed girl gets saved. Lydia and her entire house, this was a woman of wealth, she also is converted. The Philippian jailer, when they get arrested, they go to jail, and the man in charge of the jail and his entire family get saved. That is what we're believing God is going to do for Nate and Ashley. We're believing that as they take over this church, I, I am so encouraged. I don't know if you understood what he said. It was so powerful when Pastor Fifield told me that he felt stirred to go overseas, and I was actually caught a little by surprise. I wasn't planning for that. Talking with Jesse, and uh, you know, who can we put there? And God just dropped in my heart. I said, "What about Nate Nashley?" I, I, I was busy doing some other things. I said, "You call him," and he told him that story. Think about this. They went to the wedding. They were simply going to watch, and he said as he's standing at the back holding one of his cute babies, and he's got a few. <laughs> God spoke and said, one day you're going to preach here. When I heard that, I said, God, I thank you. That means you're in this. This wasn't just a plan. It wasn't just eeny, meeny, miny, Nate. <laughs> no, that means God is planning this, and so what we are believing is that God is going to give them Conversions. I close with this story. In the nation of Liberia, a man named Joshua Bly, he was initiated when he was a young boy as a high priest in, into a ritual that involved literal human sacrifice. He said that the devil appeared to him and told him he would be a great warrior. I want them to put the picture up. This is a picture of him they called him General Butt Naked. I'm thankful for the black box here. <laughs> because the demons told him, if you will go into battle naked, no bullet will ever harm you. He got involved in the military. There was a, a, a civil war going on. He said during the civil war, he killed thousands of people but in 1996 a pastor in Liberia said God told him to fast for Joshua Blight after a time of fasting he went Joshua Blight had a shrine dedicated to his witchcraft he went to the shrine and he preached to general butt naked Bly said, after that man preached to him, Jesus appeared in a blinding light and told him, repent of your sins or you're going to die. Joshua Bly gave his life to Christ. He afterwards, he went on a, a traveling around Liberia confessing his sins in churches. Think about that. He would go in churches. There would be people in there that had relatives that he had killed. He would go and apologize to families in doing this. Show you a picture now. This is a picture of Joshua Bly now. He is the president, he's a pastor, the president of a ministry. He focuses his attention on 
reaching former soldiers that he involved in witchcraft and killing other people, gang members, and he preaches to them that Jesus can change your life. In Liberia, the world has been turned upside down. General Butt Naked is now a preacher of the gospel. See, listen, the gospel is powerful. The confidence we have, I love Nate Nashley, but my confidence is not in their ability. My confidence is in our great God, whose will it is for them to go. And I am believing that God is going to go with Nate and Ashley, is going to give them favor and conversions. How many of you believe that? Thank God. Let's bow our heads. Thank God. Thank God for his goodness. With our heads bowed, I want to give an opportunity. We're going to pray for Nate and Ashley in, in a little bit. Formally ordain them and launch them into the ministry. But before we do that, I spoke about the world being turned upside down. That's what salvation does. Salvation is not, do you believe in God? That's not good enough. It's not, would you like to come to church? You can come to church every single Sunday and still wind up in hell. Real salvation is nothing less than God turns your world upside down. How does he do that? Because he comes and brings his power on the inside. You can never change from the outside in. It has to be from the inside out. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins so we don't have to be punished. Jesus Christ will supply the power. You can be born again. God can do a miracle. You can begin that change this morning if you pray with an honest heart. God can meet with you. I've had the joy of being here when Nate got saved seeing the transformation that God has done in his life through the years. And that same God can change you this morning. I don't know what sin you're involved in. I don't know what's been going on in your heart and your life, but God wants to change you from the inside out. How many people are here? You need Jesus. While our heads are bowed, if you want to pray this morning with an honest heart and ask God to forgive you, I want you to do one thing. Lift up your hand right now. No one else is looking around. How many would lift their hand? Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. How many others? I appreciate these people being honest. How many others? I want to get right with God. Over here. God bless you. Thank you, young man. Others, you need Jesus. You want to pray. Some of you are backslidden. You were saved. You turned your back on God. And God has not turned his back on you. He loves you. He wants to restore you this morning. Backslider, lift up your hand. Pastor Greg, I want to pray. I need Jesus. Others, you want God. Thank you. God bless this young man. People are being honest. Others, you need Jesus. Now's your chance. God bless every one of these that have been honest. Anybody else? I'm going to give one more call. If you've not responded yet, do it now. Lift up your hand. I want to get right with God. Thank you. Thank you. God bless all of these that are being honest. Amen. I want only those that lifted their hand. Look up at me. Look at me. In a moment, you meant that, yes? Just nod your head, yes, you meant that? You meant that, sir? You meant that back here? God bless you over here, you meant that? Amen, come here. I want you all to come out of your seat right now. You lifted your hand. God bless you. I want you to come and find a place to pray. Someone's gonna help you to pray. Just kneel down at the front. God bless you. Man to pray here. God bless you. God bless you, young man. Thank God, just kneel down here. Matt's gonna pray with you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I need a man to pray with this young boy here. Lead them in a sinner's prayer. Thank God people are being honest, responding to the love of God. God bless each and every one of these. I want you all to stand up to your feet. First of all, if there's someone near you doesn't know Jesus, you gently invite them. Give them courage to be able to come and pray. Let's sing a song while these people are praying, getting right with God. I want a man to pray there. Reign in me. <clears throat> Sovereign Lord, reign in me, reign in me, Sovereign Lord, reign in me, reign in me, Sovereign
Sovereign Lord, reign it. Captivate my heart. Captivate my heart. Let your kingdom come. Establish there your throne. Let your will be done. Reign in me. Sovereign Lord. Captivate my heart. Captivate my heart. Let your kingdom come. Establish there your throne. Let your will be Sovereign Lord, reign in me. 